Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. I'd like to thank Dr. Ralph Gigliotti for joining us today. Ralph is the director of the Center for Organizational Leadership at Rutgers University, where he provides executive leadership for the overall planning, delivery, and assessment of signature programs and services. He engages directly with the university's academic and administrative leaders in strengthening the center's role as a hub for leadership development research and initiatives at Rutgers. He also serves as an associate faculty member in our PhD program in higher education and a part-time lecturer in the Department of Communication. Ralph's research and consulting interests explore the intersection of organizational communication, leadership, crisis, and training and development. He has authored and co-authored several books, including the recently published um, and well-timed Crisis Leadership in Higher Education Theory and Practice. As for myself, I've personally known Ralph for several years, having met him when he delivered a great workshop on StrengthsFinder. More recently, we reconnected and we'll be working together on some exciting new programs for Rutgers Business School Executive Education. I know our audience will enjoy both your topic and presentation style, Ralph, so let's not keep them waiting any longer. Please take it from here. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, let me begin by offering my thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend this webinar today. I, I know these days are busy and jam packed and um, it's a beautiful day out here in this part of the country. So thank you for being here. I hope the content is useful for you all and my sincere thanks to Margaret and to Peter Methot and others from um, the executive education team for the invitation to be here. I, I really appreciate it. As Margaret mentioned in my introduction, I, I focus a lot on crisis and crisis leadership in higher education. And the work of our center is very much involved in leadership and leadership development within the context of colleges and universities. I understand many of the participants today come from higher education and work within higher education. And I also recognize that we have a number of uh, participants that are uh, representing other sectors and other industries and other organizational contexts. What I'm hoping to do today in my opening remarks here is to lay out some of the key themes from my research on this topic and to make sure to connect it to the crisis of our times crises that are impacting each of us and each of our institutions in really dramatic ways. And before I begin with the formal part of the presentation, I did want to also offer my thoughts and, and good wishes to each of you and especially to your families, um, particularly for, for anyone who's uh, been directly impacted in, in, in dramatic ways or in uh, health ways due to the virus and the pandemic. Um, I know it's, uh, it's impacted each of us and our families and our friends in, in very different ways. So I'm thinking of you and uh, I really appreciate, again, your time today. Uh, so crisis is a pervasive condition of organizational life. And it feels like over the last 10, 15, five years, crisis has moved from the periphery of leadership paradigms to center stage. And when crises occur, as I write about in the book and as we talk about in the introduction and description of this session, crises shift the spotlight to the actions and to the decisions of those who occupy positions of leadership and others who are engaged in the leadership work of an organization. This is a, a particularly striking time, and it is most certainly a relevant time to be discussing crisis and crisis leadership, particularly as we bear witness to the collision of crises across um, society, across our country, and, and across our organizations. Um, as I've shared in a few recent webinars I've led on this topic, uh, I, I was talking to a university president a few years ago, and she mentioned to me uh, this Chinese proverb of may you live in interesting times. And she went on to acknowledge that as a senior leader at her organization, it's always an interesting time. And I think what we're experiencing right now is most certainly an interesting and important and a, and a historical time for each of us and for our organizations as we bear witness to the collision of different crises. It's hard to even give it appropriate language 
to describe this moment in time and where we find ourselves as we wrestle with um, the dynamics of a pandemic at the same time as we're interrogating important matters regarding racial justice in this country. And some of the words that have been used to characterize this moment are unsettling and disorienting, um, disruptive, and heartbreaking. And Carl Weick might refer to this moment as a cosmology episode. And using that language, a cosmology episode refers to those events that trigger sudden loss of meaning. And we begin to question what's happening and why it's happening and in what ways we need one another and to whom do we turn to for support when crises strike. Um, we are seeing the statistics on different websites such as the Johns Hopkins University site that's tracking the pandemic data. And we're also witnessing the scenes of racial unrest unraveling in front of us. And it's a really, really striking moment and an important moment. And as I'm going to attempt to highlight in my remarks today, there is an important moment in crisis where crises create opportunities. They create opportunities for change, opportunities for renewal, opportunities for reinvention, and opportunities for justice. I'm going to um, center most of my remarks today around the pandemic, but most certainly the racial unre unrest that we're experiencing across this country deserves mention and deserves acknowledgement. And of course, I can't do both topics justice in the short time we have today, but I recognize both as significant and worthy of our attention. So let's start first by thinking about crisis. What do we mean by crisis? Um, the, the field of crisis management originated out of a response by J&J &J in the early 80s to a crisis that they were dealing with. And when we think about the ways in which crises are perceived, they are perceived differently by different people. As I write about in the book, crises are often socially generated and socially constructed. And if there's the perception of crisis, then there's the existence of crisis, and it requires attention from our leaders. So let me offer a couple of introductory definitions for us to center our conversation today. First, crises are unpredictable phenomena, according to Coombs, yet not entirely unexpected. Secondly, an organizational crisis is a specific, unexpected, and non-routine event or series of events that create high levels of uncertainty and simultaneously present an organization with both opportunities for and threats to its high priority goals, according to Ulmer, Selnow, and Seeger. Um, there's something paradoxical about crisis, and I think it's where we find ourselves today, where there's a craving and a hunger for certainty, and a craving and a hunger for information, yet, the realities of a volatile and uncertain and complex and ambiguous environment create conditions where certainty and information might not be easily accessible. And that's an important paradox as you think about what crisis leadership means for you. Um, the last definition I wanna mention is um, that put forward by Fink as a turning point that crises are a turning point, not necessarily laden with irreparable negativity, but rather characterized by a certain degree of risk and uncertainty. And the word crisis actually has its roots in the Greek language where it represents a turning point, as I just shared from Fink's definition. Um, and interestingly, the original usage of the word crisis uh, in Latin implied the turning point of an illness, as some authors write about. And that turning point was actually a good thing. That turning point was a turning point in an illness when um, our health re was restored and we became better. And over time, it's become a much more negative, uh, has much more of a negative connotation to it. Um, as, have been, as has been suggested by others, the Chinese ideogram for crisis is made up of two characters signifying opportunity and danger. And I think if we refer back to these definitions, and if we consider the paradox of crisis, where it's laden with uncertainty, 
It's very, it's a time marked by great fear and upheaval, yet there's tremendous opportunity. It makes the work of leadership all the more important. So there have been many taxonomies and frameworks presented in the literature. I'm highlighting three on this slide here that you might reference. And of course, there are many others in addition to this list. And in my book, I actually offer a taxonomy of crisis types that are most germane to colleges and universities that might be relevant to some of you. But you can see from this different um, listing of crises, it runs the gamut um, from financial crises to informational crises, natural disasters, incidents of workplace violence. Um, and you can see in the, the framework presented at the bottom by Coombs, there he classifies crises into three tiers, victim crises, accident crises, and preventable crises. Um, I share this slide with you because I think it's really important as you embark on a leadership journey, whether you are attending this webinar uh, in a position of senior leadership at your organization, or whether you're sort of an emerging or aspiring leader that's trying to think about what these crises mean for me personally, and what do they mean for me in my own leadership development? Monitoring the environment and trying to give some thought as to what kinds of crises might impact me or my institution or unit or department become really important considerations. There are, as you might expect, a whole bunch of definitions of crisis, as there are a whole bunch of definitions of leadership in the literature. And this is the definition that I have come to um, see a lot of value in. It, it's informed by my research on this topic that absolutely, crises threaten reputations. What's really interesting about the pandemic is that in the immediate and early days of the crisis, we sort of looked around at other organizations and responded in a pretty similar way. I think what we're seeing now when we look to the fall semester in higher education, or when we look at how organizations across this country are opening at different stages and with different expectations, the crisis becomes a little bit more um, uh, provocative because our organizations are, are responding in different ways, unlike in the immediate days of the crisis when we responded in a pretty consistent manner. But crises are events or situations of significant magnitude that do threaten our reputations. They impact lives, lives of the stakeholders who belong to and um, subscribe to our organization. Disrupt the ways in which the organization functions and the ways in which you deliver your core content or your core competency or your core services. Crises have a cascading influence as well on leadership responsibilities and obligations across units and divisions of an organization. And some might suggest that it's th this dimension of it that makes a crisis different and distinct from an isolated incident or an isolated emergency. And it's that it's cross-cutting across the organization. And lastly, crises require an immediate response from leaders, as I'll share more later, even if you don't have all of the answers or if you don't have all of the information available. So we in our center have been giving the topic of leadership and leadership development a whole lot of thought. Um, I've done some writing with Brent Rubin and others on um, understanding the connections and the linkages between leadership and communication. And I wanna offer a couple of remarks here that can help to uh, situate how I think about leadership because it informs how I make sense of crisis leadership. And I hope it's relevant for, for each of you. Um, Barbara Kellerman from Harvard University writes about the leadership system. And she suggests that when we think, when we're thinking about leadership, we can't just focus on an individual leader, but rather we need to look at the interplay of self, the individual's leader, other, the needs or exp experiences of followers, and the unique context in which we find ourselves. And leadership actually becomes wrapped up in the interplay of self, other, and context. That's been really important to how we think about leadership from a communication perspective, insofar as leadership can be formal, it can also be informal. And actually those informal opportunities for leadership create great opportunities for learning about who you are and the ways in which you engage in social influence. Additionally, leadership can be planned and unplanned. 
And what makes crises particularly compelling sites for understanding leadership is that so much of the reaction to crisis can be spontaneous and it creates a precedent upon which we're evaluated as leaders. How do we respond in the moment to the crisis situation? Um, and all of this has informed how we continue to write about and think about leadership in our center uh, as the design and implementation of messages, strategies, processes, and structures to facilitate social influence. Um, I share that definition with you because when we talk about crisis leadership, it's so easy to default to thinking about leadership as um, uh, the, the this manner in which individuals say certain things and respond in predictable ways to address the reputation and preserve the reputation of our organizations. And of course, preserving the reputation is an important dimension to crisis leadership, but there's a whole lot more embedded in how we come to understand and engage in the practice of crisis leadership. So as I write about in the book, I tend to view crisis leadership as a larger construct and it encompasses crisis preparation, crisis and risk prevention, crisis communication, and crisis management. And importantly, to think back to Kellerman's uh, perspective here, when you try to understand what's needed for effective crisis leadership, we have to focus on the style and skills and strengths of an individual leader. But we also need to be mindful of the different stakeholders and followers with whom we engage recognizing that they've been impacted in different ways by a given crisis. And we also need to bring attention to the unique context that we find ourselves in. So if we take a moment to reflect on where we are currently, um, it, there is a collision of crises. We are impacted in many different ways by the pandemic and by the acts of racial unrest across our country. Um, and a whole set of other crises that we're not even talking about in today's, um, today's webinar. And uh, the ways in which they impact us differently create the conditions through which crisis leadership might look much differently based on our unique perspectives and vantage points. I hope that's helpful. And uh, we'll definitely have time at the end of the, the webinar here for questions. And I'd be happy to elaborate further if that'd be useful. Um, so I know that, that, that for many of you, you were hoping to participate in this webinar to, to lead with some skills on what do I do to better lead during times of crisis? What does the research suggest I should do? And it's really hard to, to do this justice in a short amount of time. I want to walk through a couple of key points that I have found useful in my own approach to leadership and in working with different leaders at our center that hopefully will be useful for you all. The first is to give some attention to the different stages through which crises unfold. This framework that Coombs and others puts forward is really simple, it's really intuitive, and I think it's a, a useful heuristic for understanding how crises evolve. That there is a pre-crisis stage, a crisis manifestation stage, when you're in crisis, and then a post-crisis stage. And what makes this moment really unique is that we're sort of situated at different points in the crisis life cycle, life cycle, but I think many of us are feeling like we're still in it. We're still in it for a whole host of reasons. So as you think about what this means for you, to consider what stage are we in now as it relates to a given crisis? What are the most relevant needs and expectations at this particular juncture? And what can we learn from what has preceded us to inform how we might approach the next crisis. And that's gonna be part of the post-crisis stage. So let me walk through a couple of strategies organized around pre-crisis, crisis, and post-crisis that, that you might um, begin to think about more deeply and begin to practice in your own approach to leadership. So when we think about pre-crisis planning, there are a couple of different dimensions to planning that are really important. One is forming a crisis response team or an emergency operations team, goes by a number of different names, and to um, strategically identify the members of this team to ensure that they uh, bring diverse perspectives and um, responsibilities to the table, and to also clarify what their function is and how that function is distinct from the responsibilities of other leadership groups within the organization. You also want to scan the horizon and to prepare. 
And I would encourage you to not only scan locally in your own environment and also nationally, but scan within your unique context or sector, whether it be corporate, nonprofit, uh, religious organizations, um, higher education, but also scan across sectors to engage in what some might refer to as lateral learning, because we can often learn a whole lot about how organizations and other sectors are responding to the crises at hand. And to test that response through tabletop simulations and active drills. I don't know how many of our organizations were engaged in drills related to a pandemic, but I would imagine that's going to be a popular approach to crisis planning in the months and years ahead. You also want to develop communication goals. And this content comes from Robert, Robin Kaler at the University of Illinois. And I think it's a great framework to think about what crisis communication ought to look like. Um, when faced with a crisis situation, determine what your outcome might be. What's the best possible outcome that might emerge from this particular moment in time? And plan how to achieve that desired outcome through the language that you're using, the messages that are being sent, those messages that are also not being sent, and the systems and practices and behaviors that you and the organization are engaged in. And you want to reverse engineer the situation so that with those goals in mind, you can create a response and the conditions to get at those strategic goals. Notice I'm not saying to lie and not saying to bend the truth so that you can get the best possible outcome. And that's a really important dimension to the, how I under, understand crisis leadership, being ethical and being value centered and leaning on those values to orient yourself and your organization towards the best possible outcome is a really important dimension of this. Um, one rule of thumb when engaging in crisis communication, this is really moving us into the crisis stage, uh, to clarify what happened, why it happened, and what you're going to do to ensure it doesn't happen again. What is the corrective action, if necessary, to, to restore the reputation of the organization and to make sure that you and the organization are learning from the crisis? And then at the post-crisis stage, um, there are a couple of different dimensions that you and your team might find useful. I know we are engaged in our center in helping units across Rutgers have some of these conversations to debrief the experience with your crisis management team and key stakeholder partners, to complete an after action analysis, to explore lessons learned and to make necessary changes to account for future crises, what did we learn about how we responded to the pandemic in March that can inform what we might do in the fall if we bear witness to another outbreak? And to also create an environment where learning can happen. How did other units and other departments respond to the crisis? What worked well for them? How did other institutions handle these situations? And again, how can this uh, uh, create an environment where we can learn from one another and also make our response in the future all the more um, uh, profound and relevant? So what I want to share with you here before I um, wrap up my remarks is um, some of the early research that I've been doing on um, the higher education response to the pandemic it, it, through a survey that I conducted from March 9th to March 23rd. And as you might recall, these were the very early days of the pandemic in, in the U.S. Of course, these results are not written about in the crisis leadership book, but I did want to highlight them because I think some of the early findings from this work are generic enough and relevant enough to be um, of use for, for the, the diversity of attendees today. Um, so March 9th to March 23rd, my daughter was born on March 19th. So that was, um, and she's my third child and a, a very um, clearly the most unique uh, child birth experience that we could have given the conditions that we found ourselves in in the early days of a pandemic. And I recall March 19th, the, the, the stock market is, is collapsing and in free fall. Um, I'm, I'm holding my new daughter and looking outside of the hospital window as they're setting up the, the drive-through testing clinic and watching the news in the background with um, just the staggering loss of life. 
Um, so March 9th to March 23rd. So very early days of a pandemic. And um, we had about 79 individuals complete some parts of the survey from at least 20 different institutions representing different roles. And so I wanted to know in what ways were our organizations responding well to the crisis? What, what did we find most comforting or fulfilling? And here are some of the initial themes. Having a plan in place and quickly setting the plan into action was noted as an area of strength by many of the respondents. Demonstrating ongoing communication from senior leadership. And it's ongoing. We, we don't know all of the answers, but, um, uh, but we're mindful of the need to communicate regularly and frequently and with clarity. Um, this one's really interesting, and I know some of this might be unique to higher education, but I think it's relevant um, regardless of the context that you find yourselves in. Having the technology in place and having the policies in place and engaging in an agile response to support rapid shifts to remote learning and virtual work and arrangements. Um, so having the, the, the technology in place and the policies in place to support a change of that speed um, was really an area for, of strength. And for those of you that are in higher education, we know that that doesn't come naturally to us sometimes. We are not the most fast moving or agile of organizational types. Um, and that's by design and that, that, that's, that's an important dimension to, to um, our success in a lot of ways. Uh, and lastly is a people-centered response from the senior leadership team. I've written about this in the past that there is a, a dimension of leadership where you're a performer, but there's also a dimension of leadership where you're human. And to be able to show that humanity and display that humanity in the darkness of crisis is really an important uh, uh, dimension to crisis leadership. Uh, of course, we, there were things that we could learn from and things that didn't go so well. And I think you'll notice this is interesting. They are on the, um, the complete opposite of what I just shared from the strengths, a lack of communication from senior leadership. The reluctance to embrace virtual learning and remote work in the past complicates how we were able to transition in a rapid way during a particular crisis. So that history that precedes us shapes the ways in which we respond to the crisis or crises at hand. Um, a delayed response from individuals with emergency management responsibilities was also noted as an area for concern. As one person noted in the survey, we seemed least prepared in our ability to take decisive action. We are still doing a lot of wait and see before we're willing to make the decision. And lastly, managing the emotions of the community to help stakeholders cope with the disruptive change. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read the, the great work in HBR on um, how this is a moment of grief and a moment of loss for, for our country and for our world and, and for our organizations. And I, I think that that last bullet there really captures the spirit of, of the writing that's been done on that topic that um, we're going through. We, we still experience great loss, um, not just loss of life, but loss of normalcy and loss of um, stability. Uh, and to not help people in managing that change was noted as an area of concern. So um, the one last piece of this that I want to share with you all, and I only have uh, three slides left, I promise. Uh, what are the desired competencies for effective crisis leadership? So take this opportunity here and look at this list. These were some of the um, responses to the survey. And many of these parallel the competencies that I highlight from um, in my crisis leadership in higher education book. There are some new ones here and some that are in the other book, but not captured here. But this will give you a sense of the really challenging work of crisis leadership. It's hard to imagine a leader who's able to fully master each of these competencies. Think about your own practices and your own habits. Think about your responsibilities and the work that you're engaged in. Think about your past experiences with crisis. Think about crisis and crises that you've encountered in the workplace, but also crises that you've encountered in your personal lives. In which of these areas 
Do you see particular strengths? Do you think they come naturally to you? How about for others? Do you see some of these as areas for improvement? Three that I want to highlight. The first is uh, that third bullet there. Part of what makes crisis leadership complex is triaging the immediate concerns in front of us while also adopting a long time horizon, noting that the decisions we make now will have strategic implications on the work that we do. The second is this idea of compassion, to display humanity and to show a commitment to the whole person. I think that's really important when we think about some of the racial un unrest that we're experiencing across our country right now. Um, uh, and, and, and what are the ways in which leaders can display humanity and actively listen and show concern, particularly concern uh, um, for our, our black colleagues who uh, um, have, have been victimized and have been threatened and have um, experienced so much uh, injustice. Um, how do we listen and how do we display humanity and compassion? And lastly is this idea of being level-headed. I think it's a really interesting dimension of crisis leadership. We want to be calm under pressure. We want to be fair. We want to make sure that we're responding with clarity and with resourcefulness. We also want to be level-headed and to take care of ourselves as well. So in conclusion, let me offer a couple of guiding principles that I, um, I always tend to focus on when we're teaching crisis leadership in the center. And I hope these are useful for you. They come from lots of different sources as I cite at the bottom of the slide. I'm also happy to share any of these resources with you um, after the webinar if there are specific references or uh, questions that you might have regarding these. Um, one, consider how you would assess yourself on each of the desired crisis leadership competencies highlighted on the previous slide. Recognize that every crisis is different. My colleague, Mary O'Dowd at Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences talks about this. It's informed from her, her own background with the Department of Health in the state. Um, every crisis is different. Even if you're dealing with two hurricanes, the, the, the conditions are different, the response is different, the impact on the community is different. So you wanna plan for crisis and test your response, noting that when you engage in crisis leadership in the future, the, the situation might look very different. Um, determine your communication goals and your priority audiences, and to lean on what I write about in the book, a reservoir of goodwill that you've built up with your stakeholders. So when you're not in crisis, building these relationships and cultivating these relationships of trust matter especially when you need to draw from that trust when crises strike. Communicating early about a crisis, acknowledging uncertainty, and assuring the public that you'll maintain contact with them about current and future risk. This comes from Ulmer, Sel Ulmer Selnow and Seeger's work. I think it's a great way to think about uh, a guiding principle for crisis leadership. Always tell the truth. Um, re reflect carefully on those values and let those values drive behaviors during crisis and take crisis leadership development seriously. And I think this, um, this was not, uh, this was on the periphery for many of us before the pandemic. And I think we're gonna see an increased emphasis on leadership development as a result of this. So let me close with a quick uh, quote here. I don't know how many of you have read Rebecca Solnit's work. She studies um, uh, post-traumatic growth in some ways, but she really studies how organizations and environments um, and communities come together in the aftermath of crisis. She has this great quote that if paradise now arises in hell, it's because in the suspension of the usual order and the failure of most systems, we are free to live and act another way. Um, she goes on in some of her new writing on the pandemic to discuss the ways in which disaster teaches us that everything is connected. Everything and everyone is connected. So in closing, this is a quote that um, I've been referring to a lot over the last few weeks. Um, it's, it's from a retired teacher in Madison, Wisconsin, Kitty O'Mara. And I think even though we are um, growing more comfortable with social distancing and becoming more comfortable with wearing masks outside and, um, and keeping distance from some of our loved ones, it's still really tough. But I do see opportunity in crisis.
And I think this poem here captures some of that. We stayed home. We began to think differently. We healed. And through us healing, the earth began to heal. And I think that last part of the poem is so beautiful and just really captures nicely this moment that we find ourselves in. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. So I hope this was useful. I could talk about this for many, many, many more hours. I hope you'll refer to the book for those of you that are in higher ed or those of you who are not for some additional guidance. And I look forward to hearing your questions and hopefully being able to engage in a conversation here. Thank you. Ralph, wow, that was great. Thank you so much. My I pleasure. just want to make note for our, our audience that we do have um, purposely um, incorporated some additional time for Q&A so they can keep their their questions coming as I have queued up the ones that came in already. Um, so first, I want to mention that um, uh, someone said that that opportunity danger, the Chinese characters, um, they refer to you as having nailed it with that. Um, so more compliment than question there, but I want yeah, to, to mention that's great. That. If you actually Google that and look that up further, there's some debate over the accuracy of that, especially from some um, Mandarin speakers or it, but it's, um, but I think the spirit of it is, is relevant and accurate. And I'm glad you found it to, to, to capture the essence of where we are right now. Yeah. So um, one question was about the don'ts, you know, you talked a lot about the do's of, around crisis leadership. Can you talk a little bit about the don'ts? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think there is um, there's the temptation in crisis to engage in ways that are dishonest and deceitful, and not purposefully. But I think there's fear in crisis. I think there there's the need to respond rapidly and urgently, and as such, we might do things that um, we wouldn't typically do. Uh, and so I think the don'ts for me really um, call us to consider our values personally and organizationally, to think about what we cherish and who we are, and to make sure that we're responding in ways that are consistent with those values, and to not respond in ways that violate those shared values. Um, don't lie. Don't act in dishonest ways. Don't um, withhold information that could be relevant to help people or save lives. And, um, and don't forget that you're human. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, all right, here's, a, here's another question. And um, the, the, I'm gonna kind of combine a couple of questions in this, so, so bear with me. Sure. Um, looking for advice for people who are in uh, mid-level management versus, um, you know, all the way at the top leader making all the calls. So what advice do you have for kind of that middle management in an education setting? It might be like a department chair. Oh, I, I appreciate that question. One of the, I, I didn't want to highlight this research now because it's not relevant for the whole group, but I think the mid-level dimensions of it could be relevant. Um, I'm, I, I'm working on a study right now with department chairs across the Big Ten. So we have about 150 department chairs who have responded to a questionnaire that was sent out on the impact of the pandemic and, and in what ways this has challenged you personally and professionally. And also recognizing that it's many of our mid-level leaders that will be on the front lines of navigating reinvention. How do you feel about reinvention? Um, so there's a lot of good data there that I, I uh, don't have a whole lot of time to go over now, but I think there's some dimensions of it that I could share. One, um, you, you may be familiar with the concept of, of leading down and leading up or managing down and managing up. And I think for those of us who are um, in sort of mid-level roles right now, it's, uh, it's really critical to recognize that leadership happens at all levels. So the opportunities for influence are abundant, regardless of the position that you might hold, that you need to be mindful of the different stakeholders that you have to pivot to during crisis, and even when it's not crisis moment, um, such as those who were, uh, that you supervise and those to whom you report. 
um, and to also recognize the value of um, when you're sharing issues or problems or concerns with senior level leaders at the organization, um, to also share some solutions to those problems so that you're not always going to others with the issues at hand, but also helping to co-construct some of the solutions as well. Um, I'll just add, close my response to that question by saying that um, the department chairs in this study are, are completely, completely overwhelmed that these roles that were already difficult preceding the crisis have just increased in complexity because of the crisis. And, um, and we haven't even um, gotten to the fall semester yet. So these are challenging roles, yet important roles. You know, I can appreciate that. And while this question was not tied to and is not from the same person, I think it's a logical next question, which is, you know, we were all taught to do most of this in person, especially some of those compassionate um, type of expressions and things like that. So how do we do this remotely? Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're all we're all living this right now and trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, I think in some ways, the same things you would do in person, you want to still model online. Um, in, you know, when you're walking down the hallways and, and checking in on your team and making sure that people are doing well with their work, but also a commitment to who they are as a person, I think we need to do the same thing virtually and checking in with our colleagues um, and, of course, adapting to their different strengths. So we want to be mindful of how they best lead and the, the needs that they have. Um, I, one of the things we've been doing in our center is having monthly coffee conversations. I've also heard of other teams that are doing this on a weekly basis so that you can try to replicate those water cooler conversations in a virtual environment um, because that, that, that those connections matter in keeping a team connected and, and, and united and, um, and supportive of one another. Um, I also think there's a lot of really good research on this idea of psychological safety that we've been referencing in our center a lot and um, by Amy Edmondson and others. And I think making sure that you create the conditions for your colleagues to engage openly with you, to make sure that work is being done in this virtual environment, but that you're caring for the person and to make sure that they feel safe um, contributing thoughts and ideas and concerns is, is uh, really important. And one last point that I have to mention, I, I started this presentation by saying that the crisis has impacted us in many different ways. And for um, full-time working parents who, you know, both spouses are, are working, and if you have kids at home, that, that's, that's a challenge. Or if you have no kids at home and you're living alone and, and you might feel isolated, um, that's a challenge. And if you've lost someone because of this crisis, um, that's, that's a challenge. So everyone's been impacted in lots of different ways by this. So we need to show some grace and we need to show some patience um, and to show some care. And that, that's great. Um, one of the questions that you sort of answered by, um, by those remarks were about um, you know, sharing more about kind of the, the people oriented aspect of this. So um, it's a great comprehensive response. <laughs> great. So we have a question here about um, whether it is better to be in a centralized or a decentralized leadership model when you're in a crisis situation. Oh, uh, such an interesting question. And I think the, the research would highlight the, the advantages and downsides of either approach. Having centralized systems in place to respond swiftly and to centralize communication regarding the crisis are two hallmarks of effective crisis management and effective crisis leadership. Um, the downside, of course, and the advantages of a decentralized approach is that it invites others to co-construct solutions to problems that might exist. It allows for more um, lateral learning across the organization. Um, I think um, I, my, my work is mainly in higher education, and I think what we're going to see on the other side of this crisis are lots of departments um, being more entrepreneurial and trying to build collaborations and partnerships across universities to best solve the problems that we're dealing with and to also explore new markets and opportunities that we didn't consider previous to the or prior to the crisis. 
Um, so I, I think I could be persuaded of the value of both approaches, but I think if you are part of a centralized leadership team now um, to create opportunities for feedback and for learning from all levels of the organization is really important. And if you're part of a decentralized model to still respect the importance of um, coordinating and having an authoritative voice for crisis response and communication regarding the crisis, would be really important. Great. There are a couple of questions around the idea of um, honing leadership skills or developing leadership skills before you have a leadership role. Uh, yeah. Well, this is that's sort of the purpose of our center in a lot of ways at Rutgers. So it's I, we we have given this a lot of thought, and we we see the tremendous value in, in the importance of leadership development and being able to measure the impact of leadership development initiatives that our center and others would provide. Um, I think it's it's essential, you know, the leadership development, training and development, especially in higher education, was not recognized as critical. And we would often recruit people into positions of leadership without adequately training them and adequately creating opportunities for development. And as our organizations have gotten way more complex, the leadership competencies needed have also gotten more complex and, and, and um, worth considering. Um, I think regardless of where you find yourselves, whether you're a, a brand new alum or you're a current student or you're a full-time professional, uh, taking care of your own development and being mindful of what your talents are and what are some opportunities for improvement is so important. Being mindful of your leadership philosophy and really giving that some thought so that you know who you are and why you lead and why you want to lead and, and what you might do in order to lead more effectively in the future is really important. And uh, the only other piece I'd add to this is um, to, to not isolate yourself in these efforts. Rely on your family, rely on your colleagues, rely on people that you trust, rely on the books and resources and videos and TED Talks and LinkedIn learning modules. There's tremendous opportunity for learning about leadership development in, in the market um, and at our organization at Rutgers and, and take advantage of, of these opportunities. Oh, I love that, yeah. Um, you know, we, we really believe in the concept of lifelong learning, you know, it's what it's what we do here, and um, it definitely proves itself. Um, sure, for sure. Um, okay, so here's a question that was about um, where you talked about the organizations that um, exhibited strengths and um, that there were concerns about. Were there any consistencies among the organizations and um, uh, you know in each category? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So the sample size for that particular survey was uh, quite small, especially for what you would want in a typical survey. And there were also way more organizations represented. So in some contexts, in some of the, the, the responses, there was only one or two individuals from a given organization there. Um, I was more interested in capturing sort of the, the pulse of the moment to see w in general how higher ed was responding to it. Um, but I think it, your question, whomever raised it, it gets to an important point regarding perceptions, because even if there, if there's a, you know, I'm thinking of a place as big as Rutgers, and um, we have so many different stakeholders and so many different departments and, and, and units, um, it's hard to please everyone, and I recognize that and I understand that. Um, but if there's the perception from a share of your stakeholder group that view a crisis as not being resolved effectively or not having access to enough communication or not being aware of what um, the future might look like. It's, it's an issue that requires attention and um, a, a critical dimension of a high performing organization is having your finger on the pulse of the customer or the stakeholder or um, the constituency group that you might be working with. Um, I hope that's, that gets to the spirit of your question, even though I couldn't answer the, um, the segment question too well. Yeah, no, I think it does. And it um, makes this question a logical follow-up. Um, how do you ensure a holistic point of view in addressing a crisis when it's typically the urgency of the specific issue, kind of that in the weeds um, thing yeah. you know, that's requiring the response? Yeah, I, I think you need to, um, uh, from the crises that I've experienced personally and 
the, uh, from the different organizations that I've been a part of, when you see sort of how leaders who do this well might practice some of this, um, you surround yourself with a good team so that you're not doing this alone. And you're constantly asking the right questions so that you can learn about the immediate needs and the implications for the future. So by asking the right questions and by relying on the right people, and I also think by monitoring your internal environment and your external environment within your sector and outside of your sector, you can um, develop a more holistic frame through which to assess what I need to do now and what we need to do now, and also what we need to do to prepare for next semester, next year, five years from now. Um, because the, that the ways in which you respond creates a precedent upon which you and your team and your organization will be evaluated. You know, um, I think my my own personal thought on that um, really aligned with what you said that it's it's the preparation um, that you know you didn't know that this would happen now, but you knew something would happen at some point, and um, you know had had some level of, of preparation for it. So yes, that's and it. I Oh, absolutely, Margaret. And you know, I know we couldn't really give this topic a whole lot of attention today, given the limited time. But when we think about the racial unrest and the issues that um, that our our country is going through right now, um, in our organizations, there are, of course, there continues to be the short-term needs and requests and demands. But we also need to be, need to be mindful about our purpose of high, as high, uh, institutions of higher education, right? And our commitment to access and equity and justice and um, the short-term decisions matter, but it also calls us to question who we are and why do we exist and what does higher education look like 5, 10, 15 years from now? And those parallel questions can happen at, across organizations, not just higher ed. So um, we have a question about uh, micromanagement. So how do you handle it if it's being Im imposed on you and how do you prevent your um, you know, lack of in-person observation of a worker turning into um, micromanagement? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a tough question too. Um, uh, I think my, my first instinct is to go back to, Margaret mentioned that she was in a session I led using the Clifton Strengths Assessment. And one of the pillars of that, that framework is that we all have natural talents and sometimes we lead in ways that are not strengths-based, so that we're actually trying to lead in ways to overcome some of our deficits, but then it puts our strengths in, in the background as opposed to in, in the center. Um, so I think if you find that you're being treated in ways in the workplace that are not allowing you to do your best work, it's incumbent first on you to, um, to engage in some self-reflection have I demonstrated that I can do the work that's requested and do it in a way that's timely and of high quality? Um, and if you haven't had the conversation with your supervisor, I think it's worth it, it, introducing the question, not in a way that's threatening, but in a way that um, maybe create is more question seeking and also um, problem focused. So if there's a way to focus on sort of, here's sort of what I'm experiencing right now in the role and I'd like to explore why, how can we create that opportunity so that I can maybe do this work with a little bit more flexibility than what I've been given in the past. Um, if you've done both of those, if you've done the self-reflection and thought about sort of what your talents are and how you can create this reputation for doing quality work and dependable work that is independent from the constant feedback from a boss, and if you've had the conversation with your boss and it still isn't working well, I think two last things would be trying to develop rules of engagement that um, that you and your boss or your colleagues agree to that can allow each of you to do your best work. And, and that is a tough conversation, but a really important conversation. And lastly, if you feel like you're being micromanaged in, in a way that truly is, is um, dampening your ability for excellence, um, there are tremendous opportunities out there in other departments and other organizations. And perhaps it's worth exploring how others are handling this. And maybe is there a different place where your, your strengths might be better suited? It's, uh, that's great advice. Um, so I think we're gonna close with um, this really strong and um, impact, I'm gonna use impactful, even though uh, it's um, questionable whether that's a word or not. 
So the question is, what impact might the convergence of the current crises at this um, moment in time shape practice and preparation of crisis leadership moving forward? Oh, man, I feel like that is like a question for a future book that I need to write. I love it, the question so much. Uh, how do you even answer this? That This is a particularly striking moment in time given the convergence and collision of these crises. And if Christ, if there's opportunity in crisis, the collision of crisis, crises further accelerates that, it heightens that, it, it creates tremendous opportunity for renewal and reinvention. And I do think this has the potential to, to remake the organizations of which we are a part, re-motivate um, our, our reasons for being and the ways in which we engage with one another. Um, like what does the commute to work look like in, in September um, when we begin to get to some sort of new normal? Um, and it also, it, it really places such importance on understanding the dynamics of leadership, leadership development and crisis leadership. Because for organizations that didn't devote attention to that before the crisis, I, I think we all have an urgency and a need to really give that increased attention. That's great. Um, and and a, a very strong way to, to close our session today. So Ralph, I wanna thank you so much uh, for your for your time, you um, thank you. A great amount of time for people to, uh, you know, to ask questions, share their concerns. You offered to um, share some resources, and so we'll we'll follow up on on that. I'm grateful for that. Um, with all that's happening in the world, you know, it's understandable that people would have so many questions, and I'm glad that we got to uh, to address so many of them. Um, we had a great enthusiastic audience, so thank uh, thanks to all of you for being thank here. You. Certainly, I uh, think you would agree, Ralph, that they enhanced the discussion with their thought provoking. No doubt. Those were great questions. My goodness. Yeah. So to everyone who's listening, um, our virtual Lunch and Learn series takes place on Wednesdays at noon Eastern time. Um, we hope it's easy for you to remember because it's the middle of the week and the middle of the day. For more information about future webinars, you can always visit our webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Our exciting schedule of topics and presenters is definitely the result of your great comments and suggestions of the past. So we encourage you to keep sharing your thoughts with us so the series can continue to meet your evolving needs. We hope that you'll stay online briefly for just another moment as today's webinar ends because you'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's event. And one of those is a free form field that you can type in topics or speakers that you'd like to see featured in our future webinars. And finally, I mentioned earlier um, when our webinar began that a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to you. It will also be on the Business Insights page of our website. So everyone, Ralph and our great audience, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.